If you will remain standing for our gospel reading this morning, it is found in the gospel according to John chapter 20 verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been laying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, when she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this glorious morning to celebrate the risen Christ, your risen Son, the celebration of you overcoming death for us. And Father, we ask this morning that you would break open our hearts, that as we celebrate and as we worship, that your Holy Spirit would come down into each and every one of us and imbue us with your Spirit, that we might understand you better. And so Father, we pray now that you would break open our hearts and you would break open our ears, that the words that are about to be spoken be your words for your people that bring us into a better relationship with you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We have made it to Easter. We celebrate the empty tomb, the defeat of death, and the salvation that comes only through the sacrifice of the perfect lamb. We celebrate so many different holidays on the calendar, both Christian and regular. But each and every one of them is pointless without today. Easter is the day we point to and say that God truly does love us more than we deserve. Now, over Lent, we have spent time preparing ourselves for this day. We have spent time bettering ourselves and repenting of our sins and understanding better and better that we truly are not worthy of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. The sacrifice that he made for all people. Jesus died to bring the entirety of the human race into relationship with his Father, and as you heard him say at the end, our Father. And today we celebrate the fact that that was a success. Jesus has risen from the grave and conquered that which has always been the enemy of mortals, death. By believing in Him and following Him, we share in His victory. It's an amazing story and one that is worthy of full celebration. Now, you know me. I always love to try to inject us into the story because I believe that that's how the Bible was written. 
It was written so that people 2,000 years after the last stroke of the pen had been made could live them, their own lives into the stories that they read from the Scriptures. And I believe it's what we are meant to do when we read the stories of Jesus and the disciples, when we go into the Old Testament and read about Moses and Isaiah and Noah and all of the others. When we go into the New Testament, we find the disciples and the apostles. We find Paul and Peter. We are meant to walk alongside them. We are meant to read these scriptures and place ourselves in the story. And I believe that especially this morning, we can easily do that. Now over Lent, we have studied together what have been coined the seven deadly sins. Lust, gluttony, envy, greed, wrath, sloth, and finally pride. Now, we should have recognized that each and every one of them to some degree hold sway over us that they shouldn't. And if we were being honest with ourselves throughout Lent, at one point and time at least, you probably fell into a little bit of despair. Because you finally looked in the mirror and saw how is a God that is perfectly good, how could He ever love something so broken? And I have been walking this path with you as well. As I've told you from the very beginning I got here, I was taught in seminary that a, that a good preacher preached the message that his congregation needed to hear, but a great preacher preached the message that he needed to hear. I have been walking alongside of you and I can tell you that I too have felt that same emotion. As I have looked in the mirror and as I have worked on sermon after sermon and I have delved into the scriptures, I have asked the same question. How could God have ever loved something so broken? But this morning, this is the morning that God shouts to us in our darkness, I love you this much. Our sins are forgiven. They have been washed away by the perfect sacrifice and we are to be remade into His image yet again. The story this morning comes from John's Gospel and it is one of the stories of the resurrection that is very dear to my heart because it tells of the conversation between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Now Jesus could have had this conversation with a number of people. Most certainly he could have had this conversation with Peter and John who went to the tomb and left without ever seeing him, Jesus. Peter and John run to the tomb because they cannot believe the story that Mary has come back to them with. And we can understand why. This is an unbelievable story. Even Peter and John, who watched Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, knew that the only reason that Lazarus got out of the grave was because Jesus was on the other side. Who was there to raise Jesus? It couldn't be possible. They run to the tomb because they can't believe the story that Mary tells them. And even as they leave, if we go into the other gospel accounts, they say that Peter and John don't. They can't believe even what they've just seen with their eyes. The empty tomb makes no sense to them. And we can understand that that's a real thing. This is an unbelievable event. But Mary stays at the tomb. Jesus chooses to meet Mary instead of his disciples. We get to see again and again throughout Jesus' ministry that Jesus takes the whole of society that he is living in and flips it. He tells them and shows them that they have it completely wrong. Showing them that the kingdom of God is so different from anything that we have here on earth. But the fact is, is that if we know the story so well, we realize that Mary's no ordinary woman herself. And I'm not talking about the story that she was a prostitute because that's actually false. It was never found in the scriptures that, he, that she is that. She is told historically that. 
But Mary is an amazing woman in the story of Christ. Mary was abnormal in her devotion. On two separate occasions in Scripture, we see her perform acts that are honestly to the level of Peter's proclamation of who Christ is in Capernaum. Y'all remember that story? Peter and the disciples are walking with Jesus and Jesus asks them first, who do people say that I am? And the second question is, who do you? The disciples that I called by name, the ones who walked with me every single day, they've learned every lesson, seen every miracle, who do you say that I am? And you remember Peter's answer. You are the son of the living God, the Messiah. And Jesus celebrates him because he gets an answer. And as Jesus says, an answer that could not have come to him in the flesh, but had to be an answer given to him by God. And Mary has two other events in her life where she displays this kind of faith and this kind of devotion to Christ. The first time we see Mary Magdalene, she breaks all social protocol by sitting with the men, sitting at the feet of Christ and learning from the Master. Most of us probably remember this story only because we remember Martha getting really, really mad because she's stuck in the kitchen cleaning up after the meal where in that day the woman was supposed to be. The men were supposed to be in the main room talking and gallivanting and doing whatever they were doing. The women were supposed to be in another area cleaning the house and making sure that everything was taken care of. But where was Mary? Not where she's supposed to be. She's at Jesus' feet and Martha gets mad. She comes to Jesus and says, would you tell her to, become a, to be a real woman and get where she's supposed to be? Remember what Jesus looks at her and says? She's exactly where she's supposed to be. It's you who's in the wrong, Martha. Mary's exactly where she's supposed to be. She's learning from me. She recognizes that she's not going to get this opportunity very often, so she's taking it now. I would never send her away. As I said, what we see in this passage is Mary bucking all society in what she does. To be fair, any Jewish person in that society would have seen Martha's complaint as perfectly legitimate. Not only that, but a good complaint. Mary was bringing shame onto not only herself, but to Martha and the rest of her family because she was in a place where she wasn't supposed to be. But what do we hear from Jesus all the time? Society is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God flips society on its head. It tells us that it's completely wrong. And so Mary finds herself sitting at the feet of Christ, listening to Jesus. Mary's love and desire to hear from the Master forces her, her to forget her place in society. In other words, she has her sight set on something that is beyond this world. The next story of Mary we find when Jesus is reclining at a table eating dinner. And a woman comes in. One gospel account tells us that a woman comes in, but there's another gospel account that tells us that it was Mary Magdalene that did this. You remember the story of the alabaster jar. Mary comes in with a jar full of oil, a balm, and she breaks the alabaster jar and lavishes Jesus' head and feet with the oil and then washes his feet with her hair. You remember how the disciples reacted to this display. In John's gospel, we ha John uh, calls one disciple out by name and says that Judas, who was the money keeper of the group, gets mad at Mary and tells her that she could have used the money to help the poor because he knew how expensive that jar of ointment was. And the bottom line is, is that some of the disciples more than likely followed Judas's path of saying, yes, that jar 
cost an entire year's salary. It could have been used for so many other purposes that would have helped so many other members of the community and you wasted it. And the others are sitting there saying, we're in the same boat with Martha again. She's in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is unbecoming of a good Jewish woman. She is on her knees in a place she's not supposed to be, wiping another man's feet with her hair. How shameful. But in this story again, we see Jesus come to her defense. Do not mess with her. Do not do anything to her. She's doing exactly what she's supposed to be doing. She is preparing me. She is blessing me because I am here with her. All she cares about is to be close to Christ. And this story teaches us one more thing about Mary. She doesn't care the cost. She doesn't care about the physical and the material things. She spent an entire year's salary. Judas wasn't incorrect in, the, in, in his appraisal of how much that ointment cost her. But she doesn't care. This is for Jesus. And it's more important that I get the best. It's more important that I spend all this money on this one thing. But not only that, she doesn't care what it will cost her in society either because she is going to be looked down upon for this act. She is going to be seen in a negative light for this act. But she doesn't care. It is more important for her to be there with her Lord than it is for anything else. And then we come to this morning. Mary is the first one to arrive at the tomb in the early morning hours. Mary is the one who goes to tell Peter and John of the stone being rolled away. It's Mary who stays at the tomb when Peter and John have left. And it is Mary who is the very first to be greeted by the risen Lord. And she has no clue who he is. You know, there's a, there's a contemporary uh, Christian song that came out about a couple years ago. It was entitled, Jesus in Disguise. The whole song is about how good deeds happen in the world and a number of times we don't see Jesus immediately. We see the person who did it and it's only until we see a little bit deeper that we realize that Jesus is the cause of it. That Jesus was behind all those good deeds, all those wonderful things that happened. And we see the same thing here in the garden too. Jesus meets Mary in disguise. And he is mistaken for the better translation of the word instead of gardener is caretaker. This is the man that would have made sure that all of the tomb doors were, were cleaned and, and, and nice to look at. This was a garden tomb, so he probably made sure that all the flowers were taken care of and the plants were taken care of. He was the one that made sure that no one came and defaced the property or anything else. And Mary thinks that that's exactly who she's talking to. And again, we see something amazing about Mary that tends to get overlooked. Mary throws caution to the wind and speaks to a man she has no idea who it is. Big no-no in that society. Women don't talk to men. Men rarely ever talk to women in public places. But Mary says, that doesn't matter. I need to know where my Savior is. I need to know where my Lord is. And then she freely admits that she is with him. Now, if you all remember correctly, just a couple days ago, the leader of the disciples denied the fact that he ever knew Christ for fear of his life. And we accept that and we understand it and we give a little pity for Peter because he did. He had a life and death choice in front of him and we accept the fact that he chose life even though it meant that he denied Christ and we understand and we forgive him for that. But then three days later we have Mary doing, having the exact same conversation but this time what does she do? She does what Peter can't. 
She looks the gardener in the eye who could have very easily been a spy for the Romans or the high priest or anyone else that could have turned her in. And she says, I'm with that man. Tell me where his body is and I will claim it. We find that Mary is a very unique and amazing woman. And ultimately, we find that Mary still doesn't recognize Christ. But there's a reason for this. It is amazing to me that someone who was so close and so focused on Christ throughout his life would then come face to face with him and not recognize the man who was standing before her. But to be fair, this is exactly what I should expect in the story of Christ. Because what does Paul tell us happens when we take Christ into ourselves? We are made new. We are brand new creation. The old is gone. The new comes in. The man who stood before Mary was, not, was more Jesus than she had ever seen in her entire life. His physical appearance may have been similar, but who he was and his essence was vastly different. Just as any Christian knows what happens to us when we take Christ into our hearts, our lives change. Sure, we look in the mirror, we see the same reflection peering back at us. But if you've ever been in a room with someone who has truly given their life over to Christ you can look in their eyes and see that they are a completely different person. And then the best part of all, Jesus calls her by name. It's all it took. Mary. An intimate understanding of who he was standing in front of and all of a sudden the veil falls. And Mary knows exactly who she's standing in front of. Today on Easter, we recognize that he does this to us as well. He stands in front of us and he calls to us just like he called to Mary. Not a general call to every person on the planet, but a personal invitation. Your name signed at the bottom. He wants you, not just because you are a human, but because you are special to him. And it's because he sees us for who we are meant to be, not for who we are. Who we are presently are broken and sinful creatures that are blind to the glory of the kingdom of God but we were made for so much more than this life. And he calls us into that new life that is within him. The celebration of the empty tomb and the celebration of the resurrection are celebrations that are not just about a continued existence, but they are celebrations of a brand new life and a new way to live it. Today is the day that we throw aside all of those sins and cast our lots with who Peter correctly pronounced is the Son of the living God and our Messiah. And it's because it is only through Him that we can become a new creation. But to be fair, the better way to put it is the fact that it is only through Him that we can become the creation that we were always originally intended to be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we get to celebrate with family and friends, with large meals and candy and eggs and rabbits and all the wonderful things that are surrounding Easter. We celebrate the empty tomb, the fact that we have a cross that has no one on it. An implement of death and torture has been made into the implement of salvation. Something that only you could do. 
And it proves to us once again that you are a God of transformation. That you are a God who desperately desires for us to go back to our roots. To go back to what we were originally created for. An intimate and personal relationship with you. To walk with you as Adam and Eve did in the garden. To talk with you as the great saints of old have. To live in your kingdom. This is what you want for us. This is what you gave your life for us. So Father, help us to take this morning, to take this glorious celebration of life everlasting and use it to transform us into the people that we are always meant to be. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.